Hello everyone and welcome back to Engineering Week. In today's video, we are going to discuss how to design an isolated square footing using ACI 318. As you can see in the figure here, the footing is responsible for supporting the loads which come from the column, from the slabs and the beams. Besides that, there might be moments which the footing need to support in order for the structure to be stable and strength. The loads are transferred from slabs to beams and then from beams they come to the column, then from the column they come to the footing. The footing spreads the load to the earth beneath it. In today's video, you're going to learn how to design such a square column footing using ACI 318. In our example, we have a dead load of 700 kN, besides that we have a live load of 600 kN. The compressive strength of the concrete that we used in this footing is 20 MPa. The yield strength of the steel that we have used is 420 MPa or 60 KSI. In other words, it's called a grade 60 steel as well. The column which is located on the footing is 40 into 40 cm. In addition, the lower face of our footing is located 1.5 meters below the ground level. The bearing capacity of the soil is given to be 240 kN per meter square. Regarding the soil bearing capacity, as you can see in this table, which reference is given in here, there are different types of soils with their allowable foundation pressure in kN per meter square. If it's a bedrock, the allowable pressure will be 575 kN per meter square. If it's a sedimentary rock, it will be 190. If it's sandy gravel, it will be 145 and so on. In this example, we are given the bearing capacity of soil to be 240 kN per meter square. Bear in mind that there are a series of tests which need to be performed in order to obtain the soil bearing capacity. California bearing ratio test or CBR test is, is the most known one. Although for other materials such as rocks, these tests might differ from area to area. So with all this information, we are going to start designing the square column footing for the loads and the situations given. The first step in here is to obtain the effective soil bearing capacity. What do we mean by effective soil bearing capacity is that we are going to reduce the amounts of loads that are already exerted on the soil. We will remove that capacity from our allowable capacity and the remaining capacity will be called the effective soil bearing capacity. In here, as you saw in the slides before, we have a one and a half meter thick soil layer which is supported by the ground beneath it. And besides that, we have the load of the footing itself. So these loads should be deducted from our allowable soil bearing capacity. In here, the effective bearing capacity will be the allowable bearing capacity, which was given 240 kilonewton per meter square, minus, which we assume in this case to be 60 centimeters, I will tell you about the logic later, times the unit weight of concrete, which is 25 kilonewton per meter cube, minus, since we had one and a half meter of thick soil, 0.6 meter of that gone into the depth of the footing, the remaining 0.9 meters will be the thickness of the soil, times the unit weight of the soil, which is assumed to be 16 kilonewton per meter cube. So this will equal to 209 kilonewton per meter square. So each squared meter will be able to support this amount of load. Once this is obtained, the next thing is we are going to obtain the area of the footing required. The general formula for that will be the unfactored load divided by effective soil bearing capacity. So the non-factored load will be dead load plus live load divided by the effective soil bearing capacity, which will be 700 plus 600 kilonewton divided by 209 kilonewton per meter square. This will equal to 6.22 meter square. Since it's a square footing, in here, the area will be B square or B times B. When B square equals to 6.22, the value of B will be two and a half meters. So this footing will be two and a half meters into two and a half meters. This is the first thing that we obtained in terms of designing our square column footing. Now for the area of the footing given, we are going to obtain the ultimate soil bearing capacity or QU. This will be factored load divided by area of the footing. 
Factor load, as we know, is 1.2 dead load plus 1.6 live load divided by 6.22, or the area that we obtained in the previous slide. From here, we see that the ultimate bearing capacity will be 288 kilonewton per meter square. Once this value is obtained, the next thing is to obtain the thickness of our footing. The minimum thickness of an isolated footing as per ACI will be 10 inches or 25 centimeters. Here is a workaround that people usually in site use in a range from one and a half up to two times the side of the column. Since we had the column to be 40 centimeters, so a thickness of the footing might be from 60 centimeters up to 80 centimeters. As I said earlier, this is used by people who work practically in the site. But you have to go through a series of checks in order to ensure that you have selected the right thickness for your footing. In our case, we will assume the thickness of our footing to be 60 centimeters, from which we are going to obtain the effective depth. The effective depth will be thickness of the footing minus clear cover minus diameter of the bars divided by two if you are using a single layer of bars. If there are two layers of bars in the same direction in the footing, this will be different. The clear cover as per ACI is going to be 3 inches or 7.5 centimeters. The bars that we selected for our case are going to be 16 millimeter bars. So from here, the effective depth of our footing is going to be 60 minus 7.5 minus 1.6 divided by 2. From here, we can obtain the effective depth to be 51.7 centimeters. Once this is obtained, we are going to check our footing for one way or beam shear. As you can see in the figure here, the column and its loads are going to act downwards. However, the stresses produced by the ground is going to act upwards. This will tend to separate this part of the footing from the footing structure. Usually it's assumed that this distance is going to be, is going to be equal to effective depth of the footing. And besides that, this angle will be 45 degrees. In order to ensure that we have the right amount of depth in response to one-way shear, we are going to use this method. First of all, as we said in the slide before, this distance will be equal to D, or as we had 51.7 centimeters, which in meters will be this amount. And the total distance from here up to here will be half of the footing minus weight of the column divided by two. So as we know, the length of both sides of our footing was two and a half meters. So from there, we can say that two and a half divided by two minus 0 0.4 divided by two. This will be equal to 1.05 meters. So in order to obtain this distance, we are going to subtract 0 0.517 meters from 1.05 meters. This will be 0 0.533 meters. In order to obtain the area of this part, we are going to use this formula. This length times the weight of our footing, which will be 1.3325 meters square. As we know the ultimate bearing capacity, and we are going to multiply it by the area of this section, so we will obtain the one-way shear which is exerted on the footing. And that amount will be 384 kilonewtons. The general formula used by ACI for one way shear is phi times square root of the compressive strength of concrete times weight of the footing times effective depth of the footing divided by 6. This is in SI units. And here, the compressive strength should be in megapascals. D and B, they both should be in millimeters. And for shear, the value of phi will be 0.75. From here, we can obtain the value of D by multiplying this into VU1, which we obtained in the previous slide, and dividing it by this value. And in here, we can obtain the value for D to be 274 millimeters, which is way too smaller than 517 millimeters, and it shows that the required depth for one way shear is 274 millimeters, while we have provided 517 millimeters, which is more than okay. Now in the next step, we are going to check the depth of the footing for two-way shear or punching shear. Two-way shear acts in this way. If we go to the next slide, as you can see, in two-way shear, this part, as we had in this slide, is going to go downwards, and these two parts are tending to go upwards. And that's because 
the load is acting on the column on this part of the footing and the ultimate bearing capacity of soil is acting on this sections of the footing. This length from here up to here is assumed to be d divided by 2. So in here we have this length d divided by 2 and we have the column's weight in d divided by 2. So the length of one side of this area will be 0.4 which is the column's weight plus d divided by 2 plus d divided by 2 which will be d and in the result it will be 0.917 meters. The two-way shear will be the stresses of bearing capacity acting on this area. The area in this portion is not included in our calculation so what we have to do is we are going to subtract this area from the footings area. So we will have the two-way shear to be Two and a half meter square, which is the footing area, minus this area, which is 0.917 meters square, times the ultimate bearing capacity. From here, we have the two way shear to be 1558 kilonewtons. The general formula for concrete's strength against the punching shear or two way shear is given as this. And here, the only thing which is different is the B0, which is the perimeter of this dashed area. And that is calculated to be 3.66 meters. From here, we can obtain the value for D to be 380 millimeters, which is again way too smaller than 517 millimeters, which is the depth that we have provided for our footing. Once this is okay as well, the next thing is we are going to calculate the moment acting on our footing for which we are going to design our steel bars. As you can see in the figure here, the stresses are acting on the footing and want to bend the footing in this way. So the moment will be the load created by these stresses times its moment arm, which will be QU times weight of the footing times L divided by 2 square. So from here, we have the moment to be 199 kilonewton meters. Once the moment is calculated, we are going to calculate the percentage of steel required in the footing sectional area. That's also shown by the Greek letter rho. First of all, we are going to calculate the ratio between the moment and the section of our footing. And here, the value of phi will be 0.9. It was 0.75 for shear, it's 0.9 for moment. Since the values for rho are given against the values in PSI or pound per square inch, so what I did was to convert the values for moment for B and D to the US customary units. From here, I have the RN to be 48 PSI. These values in here are the same that I calculated in previous slides, but what I did was converting them from SI units to US customary units for ease in our work. Now, we are going to refer to these tables provided by ACI. In this table, as you can see, for the yield strength of 60,000 PSI and the compressive strength of concrete to be 3,000 or 20 megapascals, we are going to obtain the value of rho for 48 PSI, which we obtained in here. But as you can see in here, 48 PSI is available nowhere, which means that it's way too small to require steel area to support the moment. But still, we have to provide steel in order to avoid cracks due to temperature or due to different types of loading. As you can see in here, the minimum percentage required for temperature and shrinkage is going to begin from here and end in here. And the minimum percentage of steel for flexure is 0 0.0033. Alternatively, you can obtain the value for the percentage of steel using this formula. Let's give it a shot and see what will be our value of rho if we use the formula and then we'll refer back to the table. So I'll go and use the formula. In here, as you can see in the formula, again, I have converted all the units to US customer units. And from here, the value of rho is given to be 0 0.00085, which is again, way too smaller than the values given in here. So we will use 0.0033 as our percentage for the steel area required for our food end. From here, we can obtain our steel area to be rho times B, which is the weight of the food end, times effective depth of the food end. From here, we obtain the steel area in our food end to be 4,265 millimeters square. Since we are using 16 millimeter bars, the area of one bar will be 201 millimeters squares, 
From here, you can understand that we will require 21 16 mm bars in our food egg in one direction. And you're going to use the same amount of bars in other directions as well. Next is to obtain the spacing between the bars. We will reduce the clear cover on both of the sides from the weight of our food egg and divide it by the number of the steel bars that we have provided. Using this way, we will have 11.1 centimeters or 111 millimeters of spacing between two of the bars. In order to ensure that we have obeyed the ACI guidelines in terms of minimum spacing, we have the minimum spacing to be diameter of the bar, one inch or four divided by three times diameter of the maximum or coarse aggregate. And if we check with any of these, we'll come to know that that this spacing is fair enough. I hope this video was informative and helped you in some way to understand the design of isolated square footings using ACI 318 code. If you like our content, consider subscribing to our YouTube channel and following us on Instagram and LinkedIn. Thank you very much for watching.